Alors, nous allons commencer. I would like to welcome you. I would like to welcome all the members present. Welcome to the European Parliament. And I would like to welcome all the people who are following us on YouTube. This is the fourth event that we organize in the framework of the interest group in the European Parliament on integrative medicine and health. My name is Michel Rivasi. I'm the co-chair of the interest group, and I would like to introduce my colleagues, Tilly Metz, who is here with me, and uh, Mrs. Rosa D'Amato. And we uh, work a lot at the European uh, Parliament level on health issues, and we're also part of the special COVID committee that was set up one month ago. And uh, that is going to look at the positive aspects and the problems we had to face during the management of the COVID-19 crisis at European level. Other members were supposed to come today. Uh, my colleague uh, Sirti Peitikainen from the EPP group, Margaret Oken from the Greens, Romana Djerkovic, but they cannot join us today. But they do support this initiative. And I would like to welcome our speakers, our experts today. And you're going to tell us about to a topic related to COVID and long COVID in particular. You're going to tell us how we can better manage this disease that uh, was quite disrupting at global level and not only at European level. And uh, you're going to tell us about this uh, terrible virus. It was terrible for patients, but also when people started to suffer from long COVID. And I believe that you have a real added value to share with us, to tell us how we can prevent and reinforce the immune system and make sure we can better cope with this disease. You're going to tell us about prevention, management of COVID-19 and long COVID. Now, when it comes to the methodology, should you have any questions to ask, Feel free to do that, but please write down your questions in the chat and please mention the person you would like to address your question to. And we will uh, look at these questions during the Q&A session after the presentations. And of course, I would like all participants who are present here in this room to ask their questions after the presentations too. So, as I said, in the framework of what happened around COVID, we saw that some people were really vulnerable and fragile, and uh, especially in our countries, where we had uh, typical diseases of our societies. I'm thinking about uh, obesity, diabetes, heart failure, heart diseases, hypertension, and in order to improve our healthcare system, I believe it is important to improve the health status of people. And I'm sure you're going to tell us about this because I'm part of the uh, development committee. And if I compare our situation to the situation of African countries, you know, we thought it would be a disaster in Africa, but it was not the case, actually. So we know that the health status is very important. And we know we need to reinforce prevention. We need to strengthen our immune system so that people can respond to the disease if they come across the virus. And it's very important to manage the post-COVID symptoms. And we realized that more than 40% of people who have or had COVID-19 get long COVID and among people who needed hospitalization, the statistics go up to 57%. These figures are very serious and the recovery from such post-viral syndromes can be significantly helped by offering patients access to complementary and integrative medicine interventions that aim at restoring their health. So today we're very lucky because we have experts who will tell us how integrative medicine can really bring added value 
And these presentations are not intended to be used as alternative recommendations to official public health measures or conventional medical advice. They should be seen as tools that complement disease control measures and mainstream treatment strategies. And um, I believe that people will follow this at European level, but also beyond European borders, because people are really looking at different measures because sometimes the health recommendations were not very clear. Uh, in France, you had the uh, general practitioners and then people working in hospitals and the uh, recommendations were not the same. So we can really have this added value thanks to complementary medicine. So I'm really delighted to welcome you here today. And I would like to give the floor first to Dr. Joanna Dietzel, who's here with us. Um, Joanna is a doctor and uh, she's going to open up this debate. You're specialized in acupuncture and uh, neurology and I'd like to give you the floor immediately. Well, thank you very much for this introduction, Mrs. Rivazi. I'm a neurologist at the University Hospital um, Charité in Berlin and um, we're happy that we have several research groups um, assembled under the roof of the Institute for Social Medicine, Epidemiology and um, Health Economics. Um, several research groups because we have several hospitals um, in Berlin uh, with departments for integrative and complementary medicine. Um, I'm affiliated to uh, the department from Benno Brinkhaus and we have an outpatient clinic and we do, uh, thank you, uh, we do research and treat patients with complementary integrative medicine. So here are the files. Um, thank you. So I'm affiliated to this uh, first group, but you see we have um, several professors doing research on integrative medicine in Berlin. Next. So um, I quickly uh, want to show you that uh, we have done trials and um, projects in neurology. Um, I've been conducting clinical research in, um, uh, for, to, to uh, explore the um, effects of acupuncture in neurological disease. Uh, for example, diabetic patients that have tingling in the feet and numb feet to see the effects of acupuncture or in facial pain, trigeminal neuralgia and the effects of ear acupuncture on um, the somatic and the cognitive system. Next. So now to the complementary and integrative medicine for prevention during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our researchers have um, provided a qualitative review of the literature quite early in the pandemic. Um, showing that um, complementary and integrative medicine have several strategies to um, yeah, provide uh, for, especially for the collateral damage and uh, problems with uh, related to the lockdown and the isolation um, during the pandemic. And um, interesting um, strategies in phytomedicine, um, but as well in plant-based nutrition and so on. It's more for the resilience against um, uh, the pandemic. Um, next. Uh, another researcher of ours, um, Miriam Ortiz, has um, uh, conducted a survey on 1,400 um, people um, of the databases of several um, naturopathic societies in, in Germany um, and uh, has, has asked them if they use um, health promoting um, measures from um, naturopathy um, to uh, preserve yeah, health and, and increase their resilience. And as you can see, um, things like staying in nature, healthy nutrition and phytotherapy are among the ones that have been used the most and have been assessed um, as having a strong um, effect on um, health pre um, pre prevention. Next. So now we're coming to the acute um, COVID-19 um, and like the infection itself. And um, 
very interesting is this overview of systematic review. A systematic review provides a high level of evidence. We um, trust on systematic reviews with meta-analysis if we want to um, make therapeutic decisions. Um, um, so this is interesting to see that in this overview we have um, 21 systematic reviews on traditional Chinese medicine. And most of these reviews um, show the results of um, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, which again uh, provide a high grade of evidence. So um, we have uh, this big body of evidence that uh, provides um, um, yeah, signs that TCM medications, traditional Chinese medications, um, are effective in the symptom management of COVID-19 patients. Um, my colleague Christian Tede will uh, talk more about um, these um, traditional Chinese medicine. Next. The next thing is that I will talk about um, post-COVID, uh, the long COVID crisis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Why together? Because they're very much related, the long COVID or the post-COVID. Um, there's a debate over uh, the um, definition of long COVID and post-COVID, but it has to uh, be a minimum of 12 weeks of um, persisting symptoms after the onset of the infection with fatigue and brain fog, which means problems to focus and post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise um, is when it's an intolerance to physical activity. Um, so it's a syndrome and there are more symptoms such as olfactory disorder, muscle or joint pain, headaches, palpitations, spontaneous sweats and sleep disorders as well as anxiety and depression. So um, this is very much resembling the chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis, um, which often evolves as well after viral infections. So it's interesting to look into the literature how to treat um, chronic fatigue syndrome. The conventional therapeutic options at the moment that have been investigated in bigger uh, trials are resting and pacing, which is basically to wait it out and to, to, be, um, to rest and to stay under the threshold of exertion, the personal. So next. So we looked into the literature regarding a complementary and alternative medicine um, for patients with chronic fatigue syndrome to see if we can find something to um, offer our patients with chronic post-COVID. So there is a system systematic review. Um, again, here, 26 randomized controlled trials that investigated um, uh, mind-body medicine, uh, distant healing, massage, uh, tuina, and tai chi, homeopathy, ginseng, and dietary uh, supplementations. And um, the meta-analysis, the review has shown that um, it's basically qigong, so which is a kind of medical gymnastics and um, Duina have uh, effects on the symptoms of complementary, uh, of uh, symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. Acupuncture has not been investigated in this systematic review explicitly. So we looked into another review next. Um, where um, 31 randomized controlled trials have been uh, evaluated uh, regarding uh, their um, efficacy of acupuncture and moxibustion. Um, here um, I explain moxibustion is the heating up of acupuncture points um, uh, <coughs> together or without a needle. So um, they have investigated the effects of um, this, these two uh, measures uh, alone or in combination, and uh, they could show that they're more effective than Chinese herbal medicine alone or Western medicine uh, or sham acupuncture or so placebo control uh, regarding the symptoms of chronic fatigue. Next. Um, so we designed a trial, a clinical trial, to offer our post-COVID patients um, where we will investigate, we started in June, we will investigate acupressure and Qigong in patients suffering from post-COVID-19. 
So um, acupressure is acupuncture without needles. You can as well massage the acupuncture points uh, instead of just sticking a needle in it. Um, so um, this is a wonderful method, uh, method to um, for self-care, a self-care measure. So the question of our trial is if we want to uh, find out if eight weeks of uh, combined intervention, pardon me? Yeah, in eight weeks of combined intervention um, of acupressure in Qigong, have an effect um, on the symptoms of um, post-COVID syndrome over um, a treatment um, of, with naturopathic remedies alone. So all our patients in the trial will get naturopathic advice, a guidebook. Can you show me the next slide again, please? Yes, thank you. So all the uh, patients in the group um, will um, apply daily self um, uh, the, on themselves the acupressure on nine points and they will get twice a week an online live Qigong course uh, where they can get in contact with the therapists if, if they want to. And everybody um, gets um, this guidebook uh, to to choose uh, from naturopathic strategies, such like herbal teas or um, um, aroma oils or self-massage. Um, okay, next slide. So here you can see um, um, the Carson's Foundation has uh, financed this uh, trial. Um, we will in try to include, um, it's a two-arm trial, twice um, 100 patients for 200 patients all together. Everybody gets the naturopathy and the routine care. <clears throat> and um, uh, half of the um, patients will get acupressure and Qigong treatment. We will keep up on them, uh, calling them by phone to increase adherence and uh, follow up on them on week eight and week 16 uh, to test for the outcome parameters that we have regarding their fatigue and their muscular strength and the, the, the ability to focus. Um, and we will be able to enroll them per video consultation. So it will be possible to include patients all um, like Germany wide. So uh, next slide, please. So um, I come to my conclusion that um, complementary and integrative medicine offers interesting therapeutic options uh, where uh, we have um, new medical needs and at the limits of conventional medicine. And if we had more resources, we would um, be able to do um, more study designs with a higher quality, for example, placebo control trials, which um, demand more staff, more patients to, to show the effect. We need higher number of included patients, so it's um, more work. Um, and it would be possible to do more um, drug trials with herbal medicine, which are tremendous, need a tremendous work up in the, in the beginning, um, preparational um, work. And um, so um, it would be possible to do these bigger and uh, more demanding trials if we had more resources. Thank you very much. Next slide. I would just uh, show the names of my uh, team. And uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank you for listening. Merci de ce well, thank you very much for this presentation. I believe we will certainly have a certain number of questions later on. But now I would like to give the floor to our next speaker. So I'd like to give the floor to Juan Vidal. How should I pronounce your name? Jove? He's a doctor in medicine too, is that right? Merci beaucoup. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you of the organizers for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to express uh, this. And well, what I'm going to be uh, what I'm going to be presenting is how homeopathy can help in uh, in infectious diseases, in epidemics, mm. in COVID, and how can we be better prepared for possible next uh, epidemics or pandemics. Can we go to the next slide, please? Well, uh, you know, the pandemic has been very tough on all of us, and uh, there the have been strong recommendations from all, all sides of the, of the Atlantic, either from the US or from the European Commission. And I, what I want to emphasize here in, the, in these two types of different recommendations is uh, the recommendations that affect uh, what we call patient resilience 
what we call uh, One Health, what we call support this uh, One Health of all physicians together, <coughs> and how can we reduce the dependence on antibiotics. Next slide, please. So in this, uh, the, the concepts that uh, we are going to be dealing with are, uh, you know, resilience, uh, one health, antimicrobial resistance, and how all these uh, affects uh, infectious diseases and epidemics. So in, and in, this, in this case, we're going to be one by one uh, dealing with this. Next slide, please. Well, Antimicrobial resistance is something that is a problem that it's uh, very well taken these years. And the best solution is to have an efficient immune system. So th the best way to deal with all this is that people is uh, stronger. And that, mean, that, that what it means uh, an efficient immune system. And how can we deal with that? So uh, if we can have, uh, if we have an efficient immune system, then we have an effective and sustainable approach to healthcare. So healthy populations put less pressure on healthcare. Human and animals are resilient to infectious diseases and need fewer antibiotics to, and, and reduce the antimicrobial resistance. Health promotion and patient resilience further a multi-sectorial one health approach to antimicrobial resistance. And medical research on host factors will bring a shift to health-oriented research and health-promoting medicine. So to tackle antimicrobial antimicrobi resistance, promoting health, health, healthy lifestyles is one of the ways that we need to deal with. And researching and investing in safe and effective non-antibiotic treatments, and if we have to deal with antibiotics, make antibiotics that are environmental friendly. Next slide, please. So the One Health Action Plan is one of the things that we consider a uh, key factor to address these problems. And in, in this case, so the current national laws uh, of different uh, states of the European community uh, guarantee the quality and safety of homeopathic medicines and homeopathic uh, treatments. Uh, there are a lot of trials and studies mm -hmm. that show that uh, there is actually an effectiveness of homeopathic therapy this evidence for effectiveness mm -hmm. is also mm -hmm. applied to veterinary medicine. And what we, when we deal with real-world world data, we show the potential for significant reduction in the use of antibiotics if we use uh, homeopathic treatments. Next slide, please. If we, and when we deal mm -hmm. with uh, resilience, Resilient is something that uh, that makes us uh, the previous one, please. Resilient is something that makes us stronger, and uh, this is a, a, a slide that I got from a, from a paper from from psychologist. Uh, I hope that there is not uh, any psychologist here in the room because dealing with psychologists is even worse than dealing with doctors. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Uh, and this is this is our, those are the conclusions of the mm -hmm. of this paper. But I want to only stress that stressful events can impact most diseases, and stressful events may not cause disease in healthy people. So uh, the rest of the of the conclusions are very obvious. But uh, if we have healthier people, uh, they will be better to confront possible diseases and possible chronic diseases. Can we go to the next, please? Next slide. So what, what Resilient does is that, uh, well, we all know that the cause of the disease is not just the organism. It's just not the virus of the or the bacteria. There are factors that compromise the host resistance, the hereditary, mm, how, uh, hereditary uh, that we have, the, the, the genetic hereditary, the nutritional state, the psychological state, the stresses in life. So. Host resistance, as, as the biology, biology say, or susceptibility, as uh, physicians say. So this is probably where we can uh, address uh, and when, where we can have impact uh, in front of, uh, of this type of diseases. So there are uh, a lot of papers that have shown that. Uh, so stressful events uh, are related to the exposure to an infection effect. The role of stressful events in risk for developing illness comes from a series of uh, vital challenges. And in case of serious infectious disease, for instance, uh, in case of AIDS, 
So uh, people that have stressful events have poorer disease outcomes, increased viral load, higher risk of developing opportunity secondary infections, and increased mortality uh, for, for, the, for the old age. Next slide, please. So here we have the, the concept of uh, homeopathy. Next, please. Uh, of health in disease. So the homeopathy concept of health in disease shows the previous one, please. So it shows that uh, homeopathy is a holistic system that has its own, its own paradigm. So in homeopathy, health is considered as mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, coherent with the, with the OMS, the WHO mm -hmm. definition of health. Homeopathy considers mm -hmm. the symptoms of the disease as an expression of the immunological response. And homeopathy mm, drugs, homeopathy remedies, mimic the symptoms of the patient, then enhancing the reactive energy of the organism in front and making them more resistant to diseases. Cure is only achieved when we treat and we avoid and we <coughs> eradicate all the systems. And it's a proven therapy that can be useful to treat difficult diseases and with this unique uh, concept of health and disease that has homeopathy. Next slide, please. Home homeopathy has shown uh, different uh, abilities in front of and help to help the immunity. This is the, the papers of uh, Bel Paolo Bellavite that show the efficacy of homeopathy uh, with uh, neutrophils, with uh, granulocytes, with uh, lymphocytes, and with different cells of the immunity. I'm not going to go through all that, but this is for your information. Next slide, please. Uh, homeopathy uh, in the management of infectious diseases has two roles, can help along with conventional treatments. So this is something that it's useful to know. So homeopathy and conventional treatments uh, show efficacy, and it has been shown to lead to reduction of number of and length of hospital stays, reduction in the cost of care, reduction in loss of work days, increased compliance of the conventional treatment itself, and reduction in healthcare burden on hospitals. And also, by itself, homeopathy can be used when antibiotics are not indicated, for instance, in, uh, in new emerging diseases, is safe and cost-effective, and uh, this, it has different heterogeneity of approaches and can be used besides uh, these, uh, these different approaches. If you go to the next one, uh, next slide, please, we can see uh, all these papers that show the efficacy of homeopathy in infectious diseases, uh, prevention of uh, infectious diseases, uh, treatment of infectious diseases, uh, treatment of different uh, thoracic and respiratory infectious diseases in different conditions. And uh, also, I don't go through all the slides, but uh, this is uh, to show that we have a lot of uh, evidence that support the, the, the efficacy of homeopathy in infectious diseases. If we go to the next one, next slide, please, we see that homeopathy has been uh, has a proven track record uh, of working in pandemics. Uh, Hahnemann itself, uh, the founder uh, of the homeopathy, showed that uh, it prescri was prescribing belladonna for, for a scarlet fever. There's different uh, homeopathic approaches uh, for the epidemic disease. And uh, we believe that uh, the, the one that's called uh, genus epidemic, which seems the more appropriate when we, we have to deal with uh, an epidemic, but when we are different uh, practitioners that get all their data together and we can arrive at, uh, at the genus epidemic, or so at a group of uh, remedies that show the, the genus epidemic. But we also need more research on that. And having more uh, and having a stronger uh, support of this research can help us uh, develop more efficacy in front of these epidemics. And if we go to the next slide, please, we show that with COVID, we also have been published uh, different papers in different situations of the COVID. COVID with people that have been uh, in confinement, people with COVID that have been hospitalized, people with COVID in the ambulatory setting, people. Uh, with COVID uh, uh, treated uh, in private practices, 
uh, in different uh, situations. Uh, the next one, please. And so uh, we have experience with COVID. <coughs> and if uh, we go to the next one, uh, there is uh, still debate on long COVID. Uh, we are now collecting cases of long COVID and treating long, uh, uh, long COVID as something similar at uh, a chronic fatigue syndrome is. And uh, I support what my previous colleagues said uh, related to that. And here in this slide, what, what it shows is that uh, long COVID, it's been also in debate on what is that and what name has to have. Uh, you can call it long COVID, you can, kiss, you can call it persistent post-COVID syndrome, you can, COVID, uh, you can call it COVID uh, after acute COVID, which is the three different situations. There is people with uh, uh, low amount of, uh, of symptoms, people that are hospitalized and have this persistent and long COVID, or people that are ambulatory and, and have symptoms of, uh, of uh, persistent COVID. And all of this group is more related to the, the chronic fatigue syndrome. So in summary, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, well, patient resilience has an important impact on infectious diseases susceptibility. Uh, supporting One Health and efforts to mitigate underlying drivers are key factors. Homeopathy has robust published results in mitigating infectious diseases, epidemics, and COVID. And homeopathy may help in addressing antimicrobial resistance, One Health policies, and the problem of uh, long COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I always like to put these uh, very capsules of uh, take home messages. <coughs> Uh, better health means uh, resilient population. Uh, we should invest in education and research in, with all options that we have in front of us. So we're here to help. And uh, supporting patient empowerment, supporting patients that are um, best, uh, in best health is something that we have to do. And uh, I would like to give a, a personal uh, message to the MEPs that are here, are, are the ones that are listening to us, uh, trust us, you will not disappoint you. Thank you. I have finished my presentation. This is the end of my presentation. And uh, thank you for the listening. Merci beaucoup pour votre expose. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, once again, I think there will be questions because in countries, uh, as when when countries such as France decide they don't uh, reimburse homeopathic uh, costs anymore, you see there is uh, uh, quite a bit of work on our slates, and not only on the patient side. The patients used to be very favorable, but it is more the doctors, uh, the medical staff that has to be convinced. So we have to launch a revolution in many medical fields. Uh, we are going to give the floor to our expert uh, speaker, Mr. Uh, Geta Kopala Krishna, who is a, a Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery Technical Officer at the Traditional Complementary and Integrative uh, Medicine uh, Department. And he'll talk about uh, the traditional and complementary medicine contributions to health systems resilience during COVID-19, according to the WHS perspective. And this time, I'm right. You've got the floor. Member of Parliament, uh, Member of European Parliament uh, here, uh, present here and listening to this, uh, this discussion as well as I should specifically thank you, thank the Eurocam for having given me this opportunity to speak uh, in this very important uh, uh, area. Um, in fact, I would like to, uh, as my colleagues before me uh, had described to you about the specific uh, clinical benefits of uh, introducing traditional medicine and complementary medicine in management of COVID, uh, as well as on resilience related to uh, like uh, personal health resilience of indi individuals. I would like to speak about uh, or introduce you to the idea of using uh, traditional medicine to maintain the resilience of the health system as such. And uh, this is, uh, we think, very important because uh, health system resilience means the total population uh, is resilient to uh, diseases and uh, how, how people can recover back to health and the entire community can recover back to health. That's our question. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, give this disclaimer that you know uh, this is not a, uh, a, a, a official 
uh, like you know reporting from WHO. This is not. Uh, uh, this is my personal uh, observations, which I had learned from different. Uh, uh, from looking at what different member states have been doing in identifying and you know and responding to the uh, requirements of COVID pandemic uh, in the past two years, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, traditional and complementary medicine supported member states to maintain the resilience of their health system during the COVID-19. It's some. Uh, it is very obvious in certain states, and we have been able to identify that. Uh, member states had existing uh, who had existing traditional and complementary medicine uh, practices and systems available did better that's quite obvious but you know that's a statement which we had to make because it is quite obvious where it is not available it was not properly properly utilized so it is uh, that's something which we wanted to say there was an openness among the policymakers to look at all options and use all resources to fight the pandemic that was something very important because I think uh, the policymakers, especially the governments, had a major role to play in this decision. And uh, only when this openness was available widely and accepted in the society, it was possible for it to be executed within the community. And there was a clearly defined and agile strategy to undertake exploratory research and evidence-based implementation of positive outcomes in the health system. That was extremely important because we think without robust uh, uh, evidence and robust science, uh, traditional medicine is also as similar to any, any other science and health science. So evidence and uh, and uh, research is extremely important. And the, the things which are given to the community should be evidence-based and appropriately researched. So that's something which we wanted to say. So therefore, we had to make sure that robust monitoring mechanisms and pharmacovigilance insights are available when uh, traditional medicine is introduced into any new health system, especially into a condition like a pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So I would like to give you, as an example, a, a India as a case study, because it's a large country. And uh, as part of WHO's work, I was I was also supporting uh, the government of India during the COVID pandemic. So you know, like I was able to work with them. So I have some uh, some deeper insights about what was happening there. Uh, I would I would be mentioning the term Ayush, which men, which means Ayurveda, Yoga, Yunani, Siddha, and Homeopathy, which are the different systems of medicines which are being practiced in India. And the ministry, there is a ministry of Ayush, which is a separate uh, independent ministry which looks after the tr uh, implementation of traditional complementary medicine within the country. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, yeah. So in India, during COVID, uh, Ayush played a major role in, uh, in reducing the disease burden and also to increase support with resources. In, uh, in reducing the disease burden, it, it, there were several interventions of Ayush prophylaxis, uh, which I, when, I, when I said Ayush, I mean all the five systems, you know, different systems which are there, and bring down the number of infections. That was very important. So number of people who were getting infected, new cases, we, we think and we perceive. We, we don't have definite evidence of it as of now or uh, as of WHO, but there are several studies which has been published by the Ministry of Ayush, which has, which has you know, like these kind of evidences which are available. We are looking into it. Ayush uh, therapeutics were, uh, were available to bring down the severity of infection. That was also something which was extremely important. At the same time, to increase the support, to increase the support to the health system, uh, Ayush, uh, Ayush Ministry provided support uh, with personal infrastructure and finance, and also supported non-COVID uh, healthcare delivery. And like you know, like there were many things which were blocked during healthcare during the pandemic, like like NCDs were something which was almost not getting properly atten proper attention. So Ayush was a major implementation tool to manage other cases other than COVID during this emergency. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay. So uh, there were uh, 800,000, uh, nearly 800,000 Irish manpower, which was available for the 
for for the uh, for for the, for the health system to be to utilize. There was an empowered group of four secretaries, which is the vice ministers, vice ministers who were looking into this, uh, which included the Ayush Ministry, the Health Ministry, the Science and Technology Ministry, and the Skill Ministry, who were looking into these activities and you know and making sure that people were skilled. There were 33,000 Ayush uh, master trainers who were training different. Uh, clinical practitioners uh, available in the community. 66,045 Irish personnel were trained uh, over, over a website and you know, uh, who, who were already practitioners and who were given additional training to implement uh, what should be uh, what should be the implementation processes. And um, over 100,000 Irish trainees have been trained uh, by, this is other than the federal government's activity, over 100,000 Irish trainees were trained by the states and the union territories of India. Next slide, please. Uh, there were several guidelines which had been published by the ministry during this period. Uh, which you can see, which like you know, which tells you how to do a clinical trial, how to do, how to develop a Irish medicine, how to do pharmacovigilance on that, uh, what kind of a uh, like you know, uh, how how to communicate this to the people, etc. Several kinds of guidelines for all the systems were prepared and published by the ministry during this period. Next slide. Um, like and uh, and of course during the during the second covid wave you know like there was there were several other 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 interventions which had come in which um, of course you know like uh, the the um, uh, how how to manage in home isolation was something which was majorly uh, given and there was another uh, protocol which was uh, which was released on ma managing psychosomatic problems which were which were associated with home isolation during this period so like especially psychiatric problem or i shouldn't say psychiatric but mental mild mental illnesses uh, during this period where were managed with yoga and you know and meditation and you know some Irish medicines so when i say managed uh, i should clarify that it was it is not it was proposed that, and it was taught to people uh, over over different uh, different uh, uh, like um, using different different sources, including uh, including education through the web, so that they could practice uh, yoga and uh, other similar activities at home. So uh, similarly, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the impact of how many people were utilizing IU systems were. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the impact of how many people were using Ayush was uh, was studied using a using a mobile application. So, if you look at the number of respondents to this, uh, this uh, pe people who had responded to this uh, uh, like question by the ministry, uh, it is something around 14 million, uh, 14.7 million people who had responded saying that they had utilized uh, Ayush systems during this period. Like this is only those people who had used utilized the app and you know and registered with the app and answered to uh, the ministry's question. And uh, this is pretty pretty huge number of uh, people. It was uh, like you know it was public feedback. Then we they, they were able to identify how many how many physicians were utilizing this and how many how many how many directly how many patients were utilizing the advisory by the Aish ministry. Uh, next slide please. Uh, we'll go to the uh, yeah okay. Uh, so uh, Ayurveda was the maximum number of uh, uh, like utilized uh, maximum number of people utilized Ayurveda followed by homeopathy in the country. There were other systems of medicine also, but uh, of course you know there were different states. So if you can look at Gujarat was the state with the maximum number of people who had used uh, this system of medicine followed by Madhya Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. So uh, Gujarat had something around. Uh, more than a million people. Um, maybe, maybe I am not able to read it from here exactly. But I think the number of zeros uh, looks to be around ar around uh, more than a million. Um, and um, so, yeah, it, it is it is more than a million. And can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, uh, next one. And the next one. There were several COVID-related research studies which were conducted by the ministry during this period, more than 150 studies at 162 study sites, uh, out of which, you know, until now there are 55 publications and two systematic reviews which had which had come out of. This was the study which was done directly by the ministry under the un, under different different organizations. There are other other studies which had not been included in this. So this is the direct information which I have got from the ministry, which I am presenting to you here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a, after a long study, a, a study, a, a drug which was which was 
purpose for malaria, malaria treatment earlier was uh, repurposed for uh, managing uh, COVID-19 and has been found to be effective in a, in a way. And it was then introduced into the national protocol for COVID management uh, in, in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the, towards the end of 2021, uh, not to, towards the end of 2020. And it was, it was well received by people and it was made sure that, you know, it was, next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, it was, it was announced by the ministry and, you know, and then it was made sure that uh, different clinical units across the country were providing this medicine free uh, to different uh, groups of people. <coughs> We uh, uh, engaged several uh, several uh, non-governmental organizations to make sure that to identify the population who were suffering from the disease and making sure that it was delivered to them at their residence. So uh, that was something which was done. Next slide. And uh, accessibility and availability of medicine was made, was like you know, assured, making sure that many of the ma the manufacturing license requirement or fee that required to be paid for manufacturing this license was taken away by the ministry, so that it was uh, made available as long as the the quality was assured by the state drug uh, authorities. It was made available to the community, almost free of cost. Next slide, please. And uh, during this period, we should also, uh, there was a vigilant activity by the ministry to make sure that there are no false claims and no unnecessary claims on medicine. So it was it was uh, like, you know, several medicines were claimed to be curing COVID, et cetera. So it was, com it was very strongly uh, curtailed by the ministry to, and made sure that only those which are which have gone through the regular rigorous process would be available to the people and would be accepted into the system. Next slide, please. Uh, and also, like you know, p patients were given uh, ability to reach out to the ministry and you know and talk to the doctors directly through telephonic conversations and video calls, etc. Next slide. Uh, it, it's quite obvious that research played an important role in including traditional medicine knowledge and resources for supporting a policy of integrated management of the pandemic. Research findings of efficacy and safety of traditional medicine interventions need to be supported with strong policies and implementation plans. You know, otherwise, it is not going to work. Information from me member states such as China, <coughs> India, uh, Iran, Pakistan, Madagascar, Cameroon, uh, et cetera, shows a, by example that it is possible to find evidence of efficacy and efficiency and create a translation process based on research findings, even during a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, like China had a big, big uh, advantage because you know they had done uh, a very good research during the 2003 SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS uh, infection and you know and, and pandemic and uh, sorry epidemic and they had actually been able to manage it uh, quite well and they were able to translate this into into action during the initial phase of COVID itself. So from the very beginning itself. China had a national policy which integrated traditional Chinese medicine into their policy. So it was an excellent, and the reports from different parts of China really suggest that it was an excellent uh, opportunity for Chinese medicine to have been beneficial to the people. There are few studies which I had mentioned there, but I'm skipping that, but there are two systematic studies which says Chinese medicine, when added with tradition, uh, with Western medical medical interventions, had an additional benefit in the outcome of uh, ill, uh, really ill COVID patients, you know, who were in the hospital, etc. So there are several studies which prove that it was useful, and uh, uh, from and also it is understood that you know Chinese government used used it quite properly. Uh, WHO. Uh, had also used it quite efficiently. Uh, for example, uh, like our our regional director, uh, Dr. Moeti uh, of the of, of of Africa, made sure that you know like enough uh, um, study is being done in the proper manner and made sure that there is enough research and resources available for African countries to do this research and and you know bring out these medicines. And uh, in fact, that was in uh, that, that is as early as. May 2020, and in 2022, uh, the uh, our uh, the Southeast Asia Regional Director also said that COVID-19 had made sure that many of the countries were forced to take in resources, uh, which were wh whatever resources that was available because it was not being properly addressed with the available resources. Next slide, please. 
Uh, there are several things which we can talk about African uh, re region uh, in the uh, in in uh, like you know in um, in May 2020 the president of Madagascar informed uh, everyone that you know there is a there is a medicine which is herbal medicine which is useful for SARS-CoV-2 infection and then there was a set there was a regional a committee which was set up who created a clinical trial plan for them and it was it was supported with the help of WHO and all the uh, African countries and um, then. There are several uh, studies which are which are ongoing, and you know there is a phase three study which is already happening right now. And uh, if you look at um, if you look at the um, uh, data which is available right now, there are several uh, countries who are using this medicine as of now. And uh, for example, in Cameroon, um, the, the Ministry of Health has approved two products for for the for the management of COVID, and also. Uh, in uh, in Af in the Afro region, it was also very interesting to note that uh, the 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 health system utilized the traditional medicine practitioners to properly deliver the uh, to to create awareness about COVID management, COVID uh, the COVID as a disease, and and also to to implement the steps which are required, appropriate steps which are recommended by the by uh, by major organizations to make sure that you know covid does not spread and the, if if somebody gets ill it is properly managed so that was something which with the with, as a resource also uh, traditional medicine was very useful in the afro region next slide please next slide uh, in fact in uh, in Sierra, uh, it is also very interesting to note how many how many how people take up or how the population takes up uh, traditional medicine. So uh, the, the, uh, the WHO Sierra region is doing, or almost completed doing, a, an implementation research study covering 10 states of this country, uh, to, uh, of India, to find out uh, like how, uh, wh what are the barriers and, and, uh, and you know, like facilitators for utilizing traditional medicine in, in COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a study which is going on, which is supported by WHO and we, being done by the Ministry of Ayush and Public Health Foundation of India. Next slide, please. There are a lot of evidences available. Yes, it's, this is the last one. There are a lot of evidence available uh, uh, on, on this. And uh, uh, there are three databases which I would like to definitely bring to your notice. One is uh, from WHO's own database, which gives you 6,542 publications on traditional medicine and COVID. You know, it's, it's a very, very important database. Of course, you know you also have uh, the evidence mapping uh, of, of, on contributions of TCIM in, in COVID-19, which has 126 reviews there. And you can also look at uh, the, the natural health products, um, uh, 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 like, you know, uh, database, which is also available. Next slide. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So uh, WHO is paying serious attention to the experience and evidence that the use of traditional and complementary medicine products practice and practitioners has demonstrated during the COVID-19 pandemic response. It is essential to use all resources to fight a pandemic including traditional herbal medicine uh, with adequate evidence of safety, efficacy, and quality. Like other areas of medicine, sound science is the sole basis of what safe and effective traditional medicine therapies. WHO would actively promote and engage with member states to undertake more research in this area. Thank you so much. Merci de cette intervention. J'avoue que Thank you very much for this intervention. I must say that I was surprised by your intervention because in India, or we have two different types of information. Maybe we're not living on the same planet because we could see terrible images from India with very high number of deaths caused by the pandemic. I don't know if you remember, but you could see those um, numbers, those figures, um, and um, you are telling us that uh, people are, were using the Ayush method and that everything was running smoothly. And in Africa, I agree with you, and I'm not criticized what you said, but I have the feeling that we have two different worlds. And I hope that uh, in the Q&A session, we will understand why we receive do two types of information, because sometimes I have the feeling that there is a manipulation or tampering on the information. So now I'd like to turn to Dr. Thies, Christian Ted, 
you are a general practitioner specialized in acupuncture and uh, Chinese herbal medicine and you're going to tell us about the uh, Chinese herbal medicine treatment in cases of infections caused by COVID. You're going to tell us about different strategies and you have the floor, but you only have 10 minutes, please, because I'm sure there will be many questions. You have the floor, Mr. Thiel. Thank you. Um, I'm talking about the role of Chinese medicine. Uh, first of all, in the uh, outbreak uh, in early 2020 in China and uh, the role of Chinese herbal medicine during this time. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I will uh, um, have some arguments uh, why uh, traditional Chinese medicine may be of help in cases of post-COVID or long COVID syndromes. Um, as you uh, heard already, uh, during the initial outbreak in China, uh, the Chinese uh, government uh, published uh, guidelines uh, for coronavirus disease control um, concerning general strategies, uh, several aspects uh, of uh, prevention, nursing, as well as uh, conventional medical treatment, and also uh, some aspects of prevention and treatment strategies by means of Chinese medicine. Uh, at that time, because uh, of the um, quarantine uh, restrictions, uh, mainly uh, about Chinese herbal medicine prescriptions. Uh, there had been uh, several medical prescriptions uh, published in, in these guidelines uh, for initial stages, uh, several clinical stages from mild symptoms uh, up to life-threatening conditions. Uh, and these prescriptions uh, were given uh, depending on the special signs and symptoms uh, of the patients. Uh, there had also been uh, some, um, uh, I call it uh, unofficially one for all formula, like uh, this uh, Qingfei Paidutang, which is uh, very famous. Uh, you could translate it as, as a lung clearing toxin eliminating formula. This is a prescription which has been used for several uh, clinical trials later on. The focus on the uh, clinic trials uh, that uh, were performed have been on uh, the combination of Chinese herbal medicine and conventional medicine versus uh, conventional medicine alone. There have been different prescriptions, as I told already, um, according to symptoms and severity of the of disease, and the criteria. Um, uh, which have been evaluated have been uh, progression or no progression of disease to severe COVID-19 disease, reducing development of other, comp other complications, um, relieving respectively shortening of disease symptoms, some trials also reducing mortality rate and the safety of administration of Chinese herbal medicine. The outcome had been published in several publications uh, until the end of uh, the year 2021. There have been 15 uh, publications uh, of uh, randomized clinical trials, trials uh, of the highest uh, evidence uh, classification. Furthermore, uh, some retrospective cohort studies and numerous case of uh, case reports, of course, and uh, the uh, results, in short, uh, showed uh, in the RCT is my uh, uh, short for randomized clinical trial. That means highest uh, evidence rate, uh, reduced rate of progression to severe COVID-19 when combining Chinese herbal medicine with conventional medicine, and also acceleration of symptom recovery, improving uh, of uh, post-infection lung function, and in um, cohort studies also a reduced mortality rate. 
Um, this has uh, been evaluated by some uh, uh, reviews and meta analyses uh, uh, analyzing in these uh, trials. So, um, what can uh, we do with Chinese men, uh, Chinese medicine in cases of long and post COVID syndromes? Uh, after we've seen that Chinese medicine is effective in COVID-19 disease, uh, we have a lot of patients uh, who are suffering from uh, persisting respiratory symptoms, neurological, psychomotor symptoms, cardiovascular, and even chronic fatigue syndromes, and uh, a number of cases which varies uh, depending on the publications from 10 to over 40 percent of the cases and uh, as we know the disease mechanisms uh, in the view of biological medicine are unclear yet and so we are lacking conventional treatment uh, treatment options uh, and also the vaccinations are not completely preventing post-covid syndromes and uh, what we also see are these symptom shifts of the infections with different variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, last but least, there seems to be a similarity uh, between uh, long-term COVID uh, or corona infections uh, with uh, long-term infections with Epstein-Barr virus, uh, which is a known um, disease entity for several years now. Maybe there's some interaction or association. What can Chinese medicine do in these cases? Um, Chinese medicine is strong in the treatment of chronic conditions. Chinese medicine uh, is also strong in the individual treatment according to different symptoms and signs in different uh, cases of long or post-COVID uh, diseases and uh, the effectivity of Chinese medicine um, is, uh, yeah, in, is uh, there uh, regardless of the biological disease mechanism, which is unknown so far in cases of post-COVID. And uh, it's uh, not affected by different coronavirus variants because uh, we treat on another basis as the known virus variants. There has been uh, a lot of uh, preliminary evidence by numerous case reports with promising results concerning uh, respiratory symptoms, neuroimmunological symptoms, and also chronic fatigue syndromes. Um, so far, there are uh, about 30 registered protocols of clinical trials, uh, but none is published yet. And uh, that, uh, what I think is uh, urgently needed, that we uh, need publicly funded uh, research uh, of uh, individualized approaches which uh, Chinese medicine uh, can offer in terms of Chinese herbal medicine, in terms of uh, lifestyle uh, regulating uh, measures of Chinese medicine in terms of acupuncture. And this individualized approach is a strong advantage of uh, Chinese medicine and uh, should be taken into account. That was my presentation and uh, thank you for listening. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very much for this intervention. Now I'll be very short because we're already half an hour late, but I would like to turn to Mrs. Langevin. Are you online, doctor? I believe I saw her at one point in time. Let me introduce Mrs. Jean, Jean Langevin. Uh, she uh, comes from Bethesda, Maryland, in the United States, and I think it's the morning there. And you're the director at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. 
So thank you for being with us. We're going to listen to you now. You're going to tell us about the topic we're discussing today. So COVID and integrative and complementary medicine. You have the floor. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my slides here. Um, let's see here. Can you all see my slides? Yes, wonderful. Okay, so it's my great pleasure uh, to talk about how the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at the United States National Institutes of Health is collaborating with many other NIH institutes uh, on a research program to build resilience and enhancing recovery from both acute COVID and uh, long COVID. Now, when we look at the overall landscape associated with SARS-CoV-2 illness, starting with the acute stage, we see several interrelated components. There's a viral infection and a prominent superimposed inflammatory component, a vascular component, and finally, an acute stress component, especially in the severely ill hospitalized patients. But it's not clear at present which, if any of these components may be related to the development of the symptoms and abnormalities that we see in long COVID, such as fatigue or brain fog or sleep disturbance and autonomic and endocrine uh, dysregulation. But an, another very important consideration in this case is that the acute and post-acute effects of SARS-CoV-2 infections are occurring in the context of an extraordinary pandemic that has caused an unprecedented constellation of grief and over lost lives, social isolation, economic instability worldwide. And it's important to remember that stress is not just psychological. It can affect every single organ of the body. Now, this is one of many examples of a study in rabbits exposed to chronic stress for four months and who developed increasing levels of several important inflammatory markers in the abdominal aorta. And in the brain, there is consistent evidence from animal experiments that a range of psychosocial stressors leads to elevated microglial activity in many areas of the brain, including the amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, and the prefrontal cortex. Now, the, um, U U the UK Biobank study published, published earlier this year showed worrisome evidence of structural brain abnormalities and cognitive impairment in human subjects who had had MRI scans before and after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Brain abnormalities were most pronounced in the prefrontal cortex, uh, insula, cingulate, amygdala, and parahippocampal gyrus. The authors hypothesize that these changes may be related to the olfactory loss that many patients, loss of smell, right, that many patients experience during and after COVID illness. But many of the same areas are affected by chronic stress as well. So therefore, there could be a double hit with additive neuroinflammatory effects from SARS-CoV-2 infections combined with stress on vulnerable parts of the brain. Now, the point of this is twofold. First, chronic stress needs to be considered in the pathophysiology of long COVID, not just for its psychological effects, but for his, its physiological effects on the brain and the entire body. And second, that stress management is something that we know we can do and could make a big difference in helping patients recover their neuroendocrine and overall physiological function, and even perhaps preventing long COVID from occurring if addressed early in the post-acute stage. One place to look for evidence supporting stress management for long COVID is chronic fatigue syndrome or chronic myalgic encephalomyelitis that share many symptoms in common with long COVID, such as fatigue and sleep problems. A 2015 review of treatments for chronic fatigue found some weak support for counseling therapy and graded exercises, but the trials use these approaches one at a time. In contrast, this is an old study that used a multidisciplinary approach, including structured physical exercises, sleep management strategies, careful activity management, regulations of stimulant intake, 
reductions of use of symptomatic medications, and participation of the patient's family. The study was observational and therefore needs to be followed up with a randomized trial, but the number of individuals who were able to return to employment in full function was very encouraging. Because long COVID is also likely to be a multifactorial and manifest as a multi-system dysregulation, this is important that multidisciplinary approaches should be used from the start, including special attention to sleep and physical activity. Another piece of evidence in support of a multi-system approach is this review of the effects of Tai Chi in Gulf War illness, another chronic condition with multi-system dysregulation. Tai Chi is a complex intervention, including slow meditative movements and has both psychological and physical components. The benefit of Tai Chi in Gulf War veterans covered many different areas, including aerobic capacity, exercise self-efficacy, fatigue, and sleep. The idea here is that improvement in these different domains could become part of a positive feedback loop. Better sleep could reduce daytime fatigue, improve motivation to exercise, which itself could improve sleep. In fact, I would argue that it is imperative that we study the role of non-pharmacological interventions for helping with sleep as part of a primary intervention for reducing the stress burden in patients with acute SARS-CoV-2 and potentially prevent long COVID. We have some evidence that mindfulness uh, and especially mindfulness-based stress reduction can be as effective as an FDA-approved sedative in patients with chronic primary insomnia. And this meta-analysis demonstrated that yoga can be beneficial when compared to non-active control conditions in terms of managing sleep problems in women. NCCIH so far has funded a small number of projects on non-pharmacological interventions to address stress in the context of COVID-19, as well as mechanism on mechanisms of resilience. However, a much larger opportunity to address this issue will come from the Trans-NIH Recover Initiatives, which is aimed at advancing towards recovery from post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, or PASC. The goal of recover is to improve our understanding of an ability to predict, prevent, and recover from PASC. This large-scale initiative is designed to not leave any stone unturned, recognizing that this will not be easy and incorporating lessons learned from other likely related syndromes, such as chronic fatigue syndrome. This includes understanding the clinical spectrum of both illness and recovery over time in both directions pathogenesis, as well as health restoration or salutogenesis. Understanding the variability in phenotypes of people who develop PASC, and importantly, identifying interventions to treat, prevent, and recover from PASC. This large initiative is very much guided by input from patients, community engagements, creating standardized protocols, and data harmonizations such as data can be shared across multiple studies, and adaptive designs to be nimble and pivot based on the developing science. Recover will do this by enrolling very large cohorts of approximately 40,000 patients, studies in healthcare systems, reviewing electronic health records from over 60 million individuals, pathobiology and autopsy studies, and importantly, clinical trials. As you can see here, the range of clinical trials will include non-pharmacological, complementary, behavioral, and lifestyle interventions, including stress management. Importantly, Recover will be able to take advantage of the fact that it was started during the pandemic so that we can study the course of the disease prospectively, something we did not have a chance to do with Gulf War syndrome, for example. We will do this by recruiting both an acute infection cohort, meaning patients who develop acute SARS-CoV-2 infection and follow them over time, to see who gets better and who does not, and go, it goes on to develop PASC. And a post-acute infection cohort where patients are enrolled when they first present with symptoms of long COVID. This dual approach is important as it is becoming clear that the severity of both acute SARS-CoV-2 and PASC is very much influenced by the underlying state of the health of the individuals, individual, as was mentioned several times in the previous talks. 
So for this reason, we think that the whole person health model that underlies and CCIH's new strategic plan is a good framework for thinking about our approach to acute and post-acute COVID. We know that a poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, and very important, chron importantly, chronic psychological stress predisposes to a very large number of co-occurring diseases, including obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease that are also risk factors for severe COVID. And at the same time, interventions uh, such as safe care, nutritional, psychological, and physical interventions can prevent and even reverse some of these chronic conditions if addressed at a sufficiently early stage. So paying attention to the health of the whole person will be key to understanding how to improve, re promote recovery from both acute and long-term COVID. And we want to especially pay attention to stress management since stress may play a major role in the pathophysiology. So at NCCIH, we define whole person health as empowering individuals to improve their health in multiple interconnected domains, biological, behavioral, social, and environmental. Understanding how best to support the health of the whole person will be key to not only navigating this pandemic, but also to be prepared for future social and environmental challenges that we may face. Thank you very much. Merci, Merci Madame Langevin. Thank you very much, Mrs. Langevin. Now, before starting the Q&A session, I would like to turn to my colleagues. Manuela Ripa was here before, but uh, she had to leave because, unfortunately, we're lagging behind. We're slightly behind uh, schedule. But I would like to turn to my other colleague with whom we work a lot on health issues, and I believe she has questions to ask. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Presentation that have been very, very interesting. I took a lot of notes, I must say. As usual, when you come organize something, it's uh, very, very interesting. So uh, Manuela gave me two questions, if I could ask them. And I have also my, my own, and one is uh, slightly the same. So uh, I start with, with that one, So uh, because we are we know that the recognition of this uh, complementary uh, integrative uh, medicine is very different from one member state to another and from one country to another. Um, so is, is that not one of the main problems that we have is really the official recognition uh, of this complementary and uh, traditional medicine, um, also regarding that people are being able to get reimbursed also for this uh, medicine? Because now, sometimes listening to you, I have a little bit, uh, sometimes the feeling, are we not speaking there of people who can allow to afford that kind of, uh, uh, are you sure, or all this uh, very, very um, interesting alternative complementary methods? And what can we do? Or where do you see the main obstacle in order that we get more official recognition and also then reimbursement of those uh, of those treatment? That, that was one question. Uh, um, Manuela and my, I, myself, we had together. And then here's a question that comes only from Manuela, and I think it's a very good question. Uh, she was a little bit astonished, and so was uh, myself also, regarding the reactions that we get on Twitter and, and other social network. People saying we are criticizing uh, the conventional medicine and we are not serious, and etc. And uh, I mean, the message is is not in my eyes uh, that this medicine could replace the other medicine. It's complementary. But how do you explain that so many people felt attacked? And uh, so that was a question uh, Manuela Ripa um, uh, also, also had. And I think it's a very, very good question. Um, in general, maybe an, another question, if that is OK for you, coming uh, from, from my side. Um, <laughs> Yeah, in general, we speak a lot there of improving quality of life and about lifestyle. Would you say that everything you presented today indeed is not only for long COVID, but is, is in, in general for, for every disease when we speak about uh, psychological stress, when we speak about diet, uh, et cetera. So now today we, we focus more on long COVID, but would you say all these methods indeed would be would be fine with with any uh, and any disease. Yeah. 
So that were three questions. I have others, but I stop here because I want also all the people listening to us and, and, and maybe others in the room that have questions, I, I will leave the floor to, the, to them. Then. But thank you very much for your very, very interesting presentation. Oui, mais c'est bien, tu as attaqué le... Well, that was very good. Thank you very much. Those were very relevant and interesting questions. Now, before I give the floor to our experts, and I would like to thank um, um, it, uh, also the organizers of this seminar, I would like to say that this COVID crisis really moved me uh, because we really focused on conventional uh, medicine. We said that vaccines would solve everything, that it would be a miracle, and uh, we would like to thank the uh, pharmaceutical labs for designing those vaccines. We, we invested billions in those labs. They became richer and richer, and uh, that is almost a shame. But we can see today that patients are suffering from long COVID and uh, we were faced with different variants and vaccines were no longer efficient. In the face of Omicron, uh, you can still be uh, ill even if you're vaccinated. And whatever your position about integrative and complementary medicine. You were talking about strengthening the immune system. And when we were talking about zinc, vitamin D, uh, plants, herbal medicine, homeopathy, the media were not discussing this. The only solution, the single, the unique uh, solution that was offered and you know that in the uh, Greens party we do not like single crops and single solutions. Um, there would be another solution i.e. to strengthen your immune system, to develop your resilience and then of course then you will be ready to uh, face COVID and you can still be ill. Okay, because that's strange. But then what about long COVID? That's something else. I was telling you about this terrible virus, this um, demoniac uh, virus, because it's very strange. It's a virus attacking the nervous system, uh, the heart, because this spike protein is quite toxic and it can move everywhere in your body. And then there was a discussion about the DNA, etc. But what is surprising me, and I must say that I will be quite straightforward, but you know, I saw what happened in India. I saw what happened at global level. And I have the feeling that you're being very kind, very nice. And I believe that you could insist more on the added value of this medicine. We need to reinforce the immune system uh, because we have a life where we use um, and we eat too much and we are facing obesity. And you were talking about the added value of Qigong and Tai Chi, but I believe that you haven't been heard enough. We couldn't hear you. And of course, we need to help people. And we can accept vaccines, of course. I'm, I'm not against vaccines, but you need to reinforce and strengthen your body because your body is fragile. And that's why I wanted to talk about India, because we saw terrible images, because, of course, uh, coffins were burning and those were terrible images. And I believe that um, the media told us different stories and you were talking about WHO, and I must say that we didn't hear many recommendations coming from WHO telling us that we should use herbal medicine or strengthen our immune system. So it's very important for you to take the floor, but you have to take the floor. You need to speak up and you shouldn't hesitate in criticizing the system because I really had this feeling that we were on a highway and there was no choice and we couldn't think about any other alternatives. And if you dared to think about something else, you would be highly criticized. And it was very hard. It was tough. It was a very difficult moment for mankind. And I'm in favor of 
democratic discussion and controversy because it makes us move ahead and evolve. And I believe that there were no longer any controversies. You were in favor or against vaccines and that's it. There was no other choice. But medicine is very rich. You have conventional medicine, traditional medicine and all the methods you mentioned. And I'm very open to all these methods. But I believe you're being very kind, maybe too kind. And I would like to give you the floor because sometimes I can be tougher. But um, I would like to uh, ask my colleague here to moderate and facilitate the Q&A session. I'm left for questions and answers. But I, I must say that you, uh, Michel Rivasi, you have summarized the, the, the problem and, and the solution in a, in, a, in a wonderful way. It is about promoting health and not fighting disease because you, you only suppress symptoms. Mm -hmm. And we have to focus on promoting health. Mm -hmm. it, it is about real health care instead of disease care, what we have now. But, but probably the speakers can, can say a, a few words about that as well. I would like to say one one little thing. So when when they ask us uh, what can we do and what can uh, what can you offer to us, uh, it, just a little thing, one little thing. Uh, why you, don't you make uh, a small pilot study and a small pilot project of an integration of integrative medicine in a public system in one space in one location of Europe? You decide the place, you decide the, the type of, uh, of approach, and, and you do a pilot study. And then you see the differences of what happens. And uh, you'll be surprised. Because in the long run, you'll have less uh, chronic burden and people will be happier. That's it. So, but that would, be a, that would be a small thing to do, a pilot study with integration of uh, homeopathy, Ayush, uh, all the things that have been said here in, in public healthcare system in one place of Europe. Yes, uh, I think respecting people's choice is something which is very important. And um, sometimes uh, like, um, sometimes people's voice are, 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 are drowned uh, in the cacophony of uh, technical language, and uh, which is what is understood uh, and held up by, uh, by the society because their, their knowledge system is built in that, that kind of a framework. So I think uh, it is a change in worldview that's required that, you know, like by many people and, 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 and that will actually bring in traditional medicine because traditional medicine, of course, has its own its own basic requirements of building upon itself its own knowledge. You know, like creating good educational programs, making sure that there are regulations available within the systems, etc. It's not a one-day process, as Madam, as you said, it cannot happen over a period of time. But there should be a process which should be initiated. And uh, what is lacking is that initiation, and that initiation should happen. And you know, there should be a there should be a point where it starts, and that is what is important. And I think uh, that's the only way to change. And, uh, and of course, uh, the studies and everything are only supportive to it. But it is the requirement of the people, and that should be addressed. And that, I think, the voice of uh, like powerful uh, uh, people of the society will, uh, will be able to we'll be able to guide the organizations like uh, like us also like you know like it is what guides us so i think um, it will be highly appreciative if you are if your words and your deeds are are supporting this activity thank you uh, i would also like to bring to your attention the launch of the uh, declaration for traditional complementary and integrative medicine it is dec a declaration that up till now has been signed by uh, about 90 uh, organizations across the planet. And it is, uh, this declaration calls for the respectful collaboration between traditional complementary and biomedical practices with the aim of achieving a person-centered and holistic approach to health. 
um, full access to, to traditional complementary and integrative health care should be part of the right to health. Uh, there are some flyers here uh, around uh, at the table, so please <laughs> sign this declaration. You can, can go to, uh, to the website tcih.org. And uh, uh, the more uh, institutions and people uh, support this uh, initiative, the better. And the idea is that this, the results of, of this um, uh, campaign will be uh, presented at the next, uh, um, uh, the next uh, World Health Assembly that will take place next year in Geneva. So for you, the, the, the last one. Yes. <laughs> or... <laughs> Don't you have uh, anything to add? that um, prevention, as you stressed out, is uh, very important for um, um, the health system as well, for uh, economic reasons. And um, uh, it's one of the main uh, columns of most of the traditional um, medicines and complementary medicine is to care for lifestyle factors and to prevent disease. So I think there's no um, efficient prevention strategy without complementary medicine approach. I fully agree with what you've just said. I fully agree with what you've just said, but uh, with, well, well, of course you can uh, uh, call upon uh, the MEPs because we are all here together to defend uh, the complementary and integrative uh, medicine. We need uh, studies and your uh, proposal to launch a pilot project can be uh, promoted uh, within the Commission because we have people who are interested within the Commission. But I would say that politically speaking, some parties are dead set against against uh, that, be as if uh, they were fed uh, by uh, uh, pharmaceutical labs. Uh, you're disturbing. It's much, more, uh, much simpler to say there is a miracle treatment, a miracle vaccine. You have a holistic vision of individuals and you promote their autonomy, which they don't like at all, uh, which uh, our consum uh, consumption model is, uh, uh, which is in contradiction with our consumption model. And this is the reason why uh, in any possible texts uh, and I had, uh, and I took part in the uh, uh, commission on cancer when we talk about integrative medicines it's like uh, pushing uh, the uh, devil in the room so uh, traditional uh, medicines uh, are synonymous to tradition and that might sometimes frighten some so I fully agree with supporting that uh, medical model but we need studies and we might not have used uh, the uh, people who were sick with COVID to, to uh, carry out uh, randomized uh, uh, controlled trials as you said uh, with a placebo cohort uh, to illustrate their added value and we also have uh, to uh, promote uh, the integrative culture uh, in uh, cancer treatment it is a reality uh, we know that uh, conventional medicine has got its limitations and very often you are uh, called upon to improve the system i would say that uh, we we should insist on uh, exploiting uh, long COVID cases. Uh, many studies have been uh, carried out, but let's uh, push uh, further. We are not going to read all the studies that are being uh, uh, published. Let's be honest. Uh, let's consider one study, say, well, this is representative. It is uh, evidence-based, and these are the outcomes. I know that uh, you might have an opening uh, on uh, integrative medicine within WHO, so if that's the case, well, let's go ahead. Uh, and uh, if I uh, may, uh, please be more critical. Your allies are patients, are people. It's, uh, it's, uh, the people is uh, the population. And this is your advantage. 
even if uh, these people hear through the media that there are other uh, possibilities, they know that it is linked to plant treatments and a whole variety of um, medi uh, medical uh, models, and some are more adapted to some individuals. So, uh, show how rich these systems are. We will be your spokespeople, but sometimes you have to bang your fist on the table and say, here we are, this is what we do, and if you do not agree, well, at least those who are interested can then know we are here and uh, reach out. Of course, we need money, says, uh, <laughs> but... And we can ask a pilot project, because it's possible to do that. Uh, but we, we need a lot of studies. But if you have experience, if you have results, if you have good uh, uh, well, uh, results, eh ben, we must say to the people. You want to add something? Oh, I see. If we still have one minute, I, I one just minute. want uh, mm. to, to, to add that I think we have to be realistic. I'm, I mean, it's, it's certainly true that conventional medicine uh, has its limits. It's for sure. And, and we, the whole COVID, we ignored it. We did not push enough for prevention and for resilience and, and lifestyle. And, and I totally agree on that. And on the other hand, I think also we have to be fair enough to say that also the integrity of the complementary medicine has also its limit. I mean, not that people who are really suffering from an advanced case of cancer or, or really are in the need of, of uh, raising now because of COVID that we say we can help you with yoga. I mean, yoga always, I, I'm, I'm a fan of yoga, huh? mm -hmm. uh, or Ayush, or all those matters. I think we have to really, as you were saying, Dr. Diesel, uh, focus more on prevention. That is very important on lifestyle and recognize what you are promoting and we support you. And on the other hand, also being realistic where we definitely also need uh, more conventional medicine. But why Why is this? And we saw it on, I, I speak about the uh, social networks. Why is it opposing? We don't want to oppose those. We want to have you more recognition and their research and, and funding is important, but that everybody also is humble enough to say, okay, here's where we are doing our job and there uh, um, another medicine is also so necessary. That is how I hope that we recognize more what everybody I is doing without... It, w the world is not black and white. And, and as Michelle said, doing the whole COVID, we, it was simplifying the things and the world is, is more complex. But again, thank you. Thank you very much for organizing. And I will let Michelle say the la very last word, if she wants. <laughs> no, but... Uh, bon, merci d'abord. Merci à tous. Merci d'exister. Thank you very much, Fer thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for existing. Uh, thank you for uh, f defending your know-how. Thank you uh, to the chair for having organized this event. Uh, and um, we uh, might uh, still face a new pandemic. So it means that uh, from now onwards, we have to strengthen health, resilience, uh, the immune system of all and every one of us. Let's give them the information and then we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, we see whether, we'll see whether a new disease uh, will strike or not, but let's uh, bet on uh, prevention and on people's responsibility. Let's, uh, let's uh, have a critical adults. Uh, Thank you to all of you. Thank you.